Hello and thank you for joining us today for Understanding ESA. I'm Dave Grabowski. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about the federal government's recent Energy Independence and Security Act. With us today are John Malinowski, Senior Product Manager for AC Motors with Baldor Electric, Ted Clayton, Command Industrial Technologies Manager of Energy and Power Management Services, and Bruce Benkhart, Director of Industrial Programs with Applied Proactive Technologies. Bruce, let's start with you. Your, your firm works a lot with uh, consumer-based and industrial-based customers, and I know you spend a lot of time studying this legislation and the, the long-term implications for mm -hmm. end users. Can you give us just a brief overview of, of some of the, the ramifications and, and what it means to, to end users and, and why this, this legislation was enacted? Sure, Dave. Um, as a quick overview, uh, ESA is merely the most recent in 20 years of federal energy efficiency legislation, which also includes EPAC 1992, EPAC 2005. Um, it builds on those, uh, increases the scope of product that's covered, um, addresses many other products besides motors, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so not only does it increase the scope, but it raises the energy efficiency bar on, in this case, um, electric motors. Okay, and raises it in what way? What does that, what does that really mean to an end user? Well, uh, EPACT uh, standards had set the limit uh, at a certain point from 19, in the 1992. In 2005, it was raised, but merely raised again to the NEMA premium standard, but only for federal uh, facilities. Now that's applied to all consumers. Uh, so the scope that it now increases, it takes what they call subtype 1, which is in fact the EPACT standard for NEMA premium for the 1 to 200 class motors. It also includes and bolts on to that more coverage, which uh, is the 2 to 500 horsepower uh, NEMA B class motors. And in addition, it starts to round up the other motors which were previously not covered by EPACT, uh, which is they classify as subtype 2, which mm -hmm. includes close coupled motors, uh, 600 volt and less motors, vertical uh, motors, and so forth. Okay, and uh, when, do this, was, when does this legislation take effect? It takes effect specifically on December 19th of this year. Okay, all right, so it's coming out quickly. Indeed. John, as one of the leading manufacturers of electric motors in the world, can you tell us a little bit about what the, the ramifications of, of that are for you as a manufacturer, and then in turn, you know, how, how that's going to affect end users? Sure. Well, this uh, ESA Act is um, regulating the efficiency of electric motors that we can make as a motor manufacturer. It builds on the EPACT legislation of 1992, which was enacted in 97. That set certain efficiencies for 1 to 200 horsepower motors at NEMA MG1 Table 1211 energy efficient motors. Okay. The motors that were energy efficient in that 1 to 200 horse range in 97 now move up to the NEMA premium level MG1 table 1211. The motors that were not covered back in EPACT are now moving up to table 1211, the, the old EPACT levels. That'll be the subtype 2 motors, the close coupled pump motors, the footless motors, um, design C motors, U-frame motors, all of those and a few others have to move up to 1211, as will 201 to 500 horsepower motors. Okay. It, what about existing inventories? I mean, there are a lot of people, you know, both your own inventories and, and you know, our, our inventories as a distributor, and then, of course, you know, the, the stock rooms and the inventories that are there for end users. Are those now obsolete? Are those still able to be used? Right. The, the law requires us to make the change over to the new motors on the 19th. So the existing inventory that we have as a manufacturer, that you have as a distributor, and that the end user has, can be utilized. Okay. No restriction. And what about cost implications? You know, the, the, as, as people are, are <coughs> upgrading or as you're having to manufacture a higher standard of motor, what's that going to mean for the end user in terms of a cost increase? To go from a lower efficiency motor to one with higher efficiency, we use more material, more electrical steel, more copper, more aluminum, mm -hmm. um, more cost. Um, what you would see on uh, the difference between an energy efficient and a premium efficient motor might be an average of 20 or 30 percent. 
additional cost. Okay. So uh, are we talking about model number changes here? I mean, are people going to have to, to change their specifications, uh, or, or is this just an, an upgrade to the existing motor, you know, the existing manufactured motors? For most cases, the model numbers are already in the system, and customers are buying them. The non-compliant motors that are the <coughs> ones being replaced by the premium, the non-compliant numbers will go away and be supplemented by the model number. In other words, a Super E motor is an EM3546T will replace an M3546T in the Baldor system. And are there any concerns with the, a manufacturer's ability to comply with the new standards? Uh, Baldor Electric is ready for the standards. We've been converting to this for the last three years. But you, you find that the manufacturers... Well, you know, I think it may come into play for some of the import brands. You know, Baldor is in a position of leading the industry. They've been manufacturing mm -hmm. a high efficiency motor for decades. Mm -hmm. They're in a good position to adopt what the legislation is asking. But I wonder if a number of the import products that may have only manufactured standard and EPACT level efficiencies, you know, we're not quite sure if they're prepared to make the investments to get into position to produce the NEMA premium levels. Okay, so something to be aware of, obviously. Yeah. So, uh, Ted, what about end users then? You know, are they going to have to reconfigure their systems as they're, they're changing specifications, upgrading to the, to the new standards? You know, the biggest place for people to pay attention is on the speed of the driven load. The more efficient motor runs a little bit faster than EPACT, which ran a little bit faster than the older standard efficient products. The most significant case would be variable torque applications like fans and pumps. Centrifugal loads, um, if the speed increases, then the energy required to operate the load increases. And that may be not exactly what the market's expecting. They're thinking lower energy costs with higher efficiency product, but as it's applied, it's a consideration that needs to be looked at closely. Okay. And, um, you know, what about just reusing their old motors? Can they continue to get those rewound? Is that uh, anything that's being controlled? Yeah, that's, that's a viable option. The legislation doesn't preclude people from making repairs and continuing to make repairs. But I think if... Um, if people are paying attention to what's intended here. You know, it's about national security, it's about energy independence. There's an opportunity to lower the cost of operations for that end user if they'll follow the intent of the legislation. Okay, great. And Bruce, what's your experience been along those lines? Are you finding that people are, are embracing the, this opportunity to, to upgrade or has there been more reluctance, more resistance towards it? Well, as John pointed out, uh, the NEMA premium motor now being the standard, has been around for quite some time. It's not uh, new to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, adoption in our experience with our research in New York State for NYSERDA and our surveys indicates that the adoption rate has not been as fast as we might have expected. Um, and there are a variety of reasons. People do rewind motors. Uh, they're in certain circumstances and uh, there are cost savings to be had there. However, um, as those motors do ultimately fail, they'll have to be replaced with NEMA Premium, which uh, presents certain issues you, that have to be addressed. Um, however, the energy savings are, can be profound. Um, as John, of course, can point out, uh, the first cost is uh, minuscule, uh, a few percentage of what the life cycle cost of the motor is. So it's money well spent, provided you're prepared to uh, address the issues that higher speeds present. Well, you know, certainly given the state of the economy and, and people's reluctance to take on what could be a you know, 20, 25, 30 percent cost increase in some cases, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's understandable that people would be hesitant to, to bite that off if they, if they could avoid it. But uh, isn't it important that they look beyond that, just the, you know, the, the upfront costs and, and understand what the, the total savings opportunity is? Ted, can you, can yeah, you talk I, a little bit about that? I think you've hit the proper perspective mm -hmm. here. You know, this is an opportunity to improve their overall operations and take energy cost down. Um, to put some numbers to it, on an annual basis, this change would offer hundreds of thousands of kilowatt hour savings to a typical user. In dollars, it's tens of thousands of dollars of savings in the operating cost. And uh, for those pursuing sustainability, you know, there's tens of tons of carbon emission equivalent benefit here too. So yes, it's a consideration to look at first cost, but it's a much more significant consideration to look at the operating cost. And then how are you defining a typical user? I mean, you, you could be talking to a manufacturer that's a, a mom-and-pop shop on up to, you know, a large automotive manufacturer. Mm -hmm. with, 
Well, you know, it, it varies a little bit with their motor population, large motors and small motors. If people look closely, they'll actually find there's a greater opportunity for savings on smaller <laughs> ratings in terms of percentage saved than there is on the high horsepower. So depending on their plant and the population, if they've got a lot of small motors, they may be thinking it's not very significant because they're small motors. That'd be actually not true. If they look at the numbers, there's a significant, more significant increase in efficiency on the lower horsepower ratings. And so then the next consideration, depending on their business and their plant operations, run hours. The more run hours involved, the higher the cost to operate the equipment and the greater the savings to be gained with this change. And of course their rate, whatever their rate structure happens to be, kilowatt hour. Yeah.